Welcome everybody. Welcome back to the third session on our discussion of money and empire, uh, the Charlie Kindleberger book that Perry Merling wrote. Uh, we're digging into the last uh, of the chapters, chapters eight, nine, and 10. And I'll briefly, uh, as in previous sessions, give a brief overview of the key sort of messages, at least according to me, uh, the key findings, the key um, points of each chapter, and then we'll um, get into a discussion subsequently in more detail. This will be a bit of a shorter discussion because those of you who will be watching will see that there's a discussion with Perry directly on our on our questions and our um, the points we'd like to raise with him later today. So we will not go into an extended conversation today on, on these three chapters. Just to recap, uh, the first discussion was on the formation of his life. Um, the, key, the key point here was that he's a man um, of practice, a um, person who worked very, very closely in uh, had a formation at Columbia University. Um, his first his, his first sort of big uh, point in upbringing was um, working on the international monetary system as an outgrowth of the idea of monetary integration that his, his vision was to extend that for the sort of for the US and he wanted to extend that in itself for the world. So that's the underlying model that Perry had explained and why and why that was the case from, his, from the Columbia chapter early on and then him digging into the work in public service and this essentially becoming an intelligence officer and that sort of informed his method, which was to work with this, with facts on the ground, with uh, reports that were being written and him sort of weaving those together. together. The, the reason that that uh, part is important because it's intellectual formation and also uh, takes us why he was not necessarily successful in integrating into the MIT department in the discussion we had last last time. Um, so that's one big discussion because the the method that he was bringing to the table was uh, was not uh, compatible with the method that became the dominant one at MIT and in economics in general, which is sort of the frame of ISLM, um, the, uh, and especially how money enters into the question, uh, and uh, specifically also the national nature of the conversation that ISLM imposes rather than the global or international international conversation. So we last time talked about him, of course, uh, seeing this vision of the dollar system being one international system, a public good that has been managed by a leader. We'll get into that today as well. But the key, the key point of contention was that this vision was not fully reflected or at all reflected uh, in a number of different ways through the dominant ISLM model that then became important. And second important point from last, from last conversation was of course that, um, that his, the lack of security clearance then also took away a lot of the, hay, the haystack that Perry references. So the information, the facts that he had access to he then had to find something else, which then leads him into then economic history, sort of the abundant facts that historians are bringing up to then be, be the facts that he then evaluates. So this kind of brings us then to the sort of last part of the book, which is um, him breaking free, sort of becoming, uh, you know, uh, him being able to actualize himself in this particular mode, which is sort of that of an economic historian, but a particular economic historian, which is um, one that interprets facts rather than gathers new facts. Uh, one that sort of tries to evaluate economic theory against actual evidence. So that's the main, the main point that uh, in terms of method that Perry brings out. So we didn't have them in three chapters, but the main thing is that they're, we're essentially talking about three main works that uh, are uh, written in this style. Um, World and Depression, obviously. Um, there's one 
edition and a second edition. One was written against sort of the, the Friedman monetary um, orthodoxy, the second then against the Keynesian orthodoxy. Then we have uh, financial history of Western Europe, which is basically chapter nine is essentially um, dedicated uh, completely to that that book. Uh, and we've read it already uh, the first half in, in, in our reading group. So we, we can refer back to those discussions as well. It's really helpful to see Perry's interpretation because a lot we are running into, into essentially the same issues of not seeing the red thread here. And that's sort of maybe one knack on Kindleberger that he was not able to articulate his sort of method, his vision very, very clearly in these books. Uh, and Perry, Perry's task is sort of to, to, to clear this out. Um, the third book, let me just make sure I get those three books, World and Depression, Manias, Pendex and Crashes, and uh, Financial History of Western Europe. Manias, Pendex and Crashes is basically an extension to test not just the historical um, economic theory to um, the case of the world depression, which we can get into the details or what his prescription is, but meaning his appendix and crashes is to highlight uh, the, the inherent instability of credit uh, and how theory deals with that in a whole bunch of other different cases, uh, much broader than uh, just world and depression. Because he sat, sort of finds this sort of historical regularity that we have sort of a financial crisis over 400 years every 10 years, something like that. And uh, he just wants to bring that up. And the financial history of Western Europe uh, goes to say that is the as the he considers his, his chef of um, sort of his his sort of masterwork. Um, this is quite interesting because it sort of deals in three chapters, and Perry is a little bit puzzled in in this discussion of why it's three chapters or three sort of sections: money, banking, finance, in sort of a chronological order. But um, the main, it, it's, it's, it's a showcase of just the amount of, of facts that Charlie is able to assemble. And then also uh, the way that he's able to emphasize some key theoretical points that we'll get into. But the, the nature of money, what's the essential nature of money, I think is, a, is, a, is an important point uh the, the fact that money the, the established money is usually scarce and that market practice tries to create uh, supplemental money substitutes that's sort of the first part of that chapter and um then the interesting point uh that is brought out, out is often um that there's a new type of instability that we kind of tend to Underemphasized that it comes with Gresham's law of having multiple monies in the system. That coordination problem is somehow a key point that Perry brings out in this in this particular chapter. The second section is obviously then going from money to banking, and that's uh, I think uh, the Gershon Kron uh, theory is sort of dealt with in detail. And he's very sympathetic to that because Gershon Kron also emphasizes economic development as essentially, especially for the the, those who are uh, following uh, the, the leader, um, sort of following the first mover, um, a way to catch up and banking being the supercharger of that catch up process. But then he of course has sort of uh, problems with specific um, points uh, of the theory, which we'll get into why he differs with Gush and Krohn on specific instances. For instance, uh, why the French case is not a very good, um, uh, very good evidence for his own thesis, uh, Gershon Kron, that is. And so I think that's quite interesting to get into those details. Um, and the final point, the final point is then to uh, that chapter is that he basically deals with his own, his own uh, history, uh, his own personal history, the things he dealt with that is from the interwar period on. Uh, this tremendous uh, displacement, which is a key theoretical point he brings out and attributes to Minsky, which Minsky never actually mentioned uh, this word, but displacement um, being um, a key driver um, and a key mover. And basically what this means is that there, there is uh, 
uh, a way in which financial connections and trade and finance get either reframed or capped and new needs arise. And that's therefore these displacements, which is typically the best instance is war, beginning of war, end of war. I know a lot of financial innovation needs to happen to sort of accommodate um, the massive need of resources and finance to move those resources. So that's essentially the point. And displacement happens in the interwar period, obviously, and he, he deals with that uh, as, a, as a chapter. One thing in, we can get into is this whole sort of how he frames the whole um, elasticity and discipline debate in the sort of the expansionist contractionist debates that um, you know he, he attributes to later also the currency and the banking school and all these other schools so in the Keynesian and the monetarists these are frames it all in the sort of in a sim in a very um, long historical line but there's always this tension and he tries to find another way around that conversation and Gresham's law is actually again one way to find another frame to these conversations that doesn't fall into these dichotomies. So that's chapter nine, uh, Chef Dervre. Um, what I have here is then a quick sort of summary of chapter 10, which is the last chapter, and he calls it leadership. And that's sort of um, essentially dealing with the idea um, that is, of course, developed earlier in the book as well, that the international system um, needs a leader to to sustain itself, and he tries to bring that message home uh, because he surprisingly got got elected to the American Economics Association uh, to the presidency of the American Economics Association, and he um, he delivers uh, a keynote speech and he assembles different panels, and the main. The main message in that speech, uh, he entitles it International Public Goods Without International Government. And that's sort of framing the conversation of leadership in language economists might understand, which is the language of public goods. And this leadership is a public good. I think he would also say that leadership and followership is a public good. Um, it's a, and he also tries to emphasize the two way street between, between politics and economics. And that this is a conversation that has to be held globally, not nationally. So these are jabs both at the economics profession and political science because they tend to have a national frame on these conversations. Um, he sees, of course, this sort of key currency leadership concept as imperfect. Um, there's nothing great about that because um, leadership inherently will be attacked, as we can hear already in our own conversations. If you have an inherent resistance to this sort of you can frame it in many different ways, imperialism, um, colonialism, all this kind of stuff, and easy, easily invoked as a, as a conversation. So he then also says, we should, it should be best be dis disguised. And maybe Bretton Woods was played that function, uh, not to be a top-down sort of multilateral thing that actually doesn't work, but it was a disguise of the US leadership that was beneath it, right? So it was a way to, to disguise that leadership in a benevolent way um, and not incite resentment which it did anyway, we had that, that conversation anyway. But then also the value of followership, you know, he kind of talks about Germany and the US in the post-war period, that that was a very good example of, of um, followership is also a virtue, which is to sort of follow the lead and accept the leadership of another country and sort of support them uh, in following their lead. And uh, he sort of says, okay, an example of that of course is that Germany uh, it was a very particular circumstance in which this could happen in the post-war period. Um, and, um, but it worked because Germany did of course thrive with, a, with what he called the just one uh, the economic miracle. Yeah, so that's basically uh, the main thrust of chapter 10 to, to talk about these leadership, this, this, the US role in the 20th century in leadership. And I think that's maybe, maybe my quick summary of this last, uh, this last section of the book. Just leave it at that for the big overview. Now we can get into the discussion of the individual chapters, the chapters you like. Uh, question about the instability of Gresham's law bit that we touched on in the in, in, in the first chapter. He was saying that um, you know it, it, the, the market has a tendency to um, to succeed in creating new kinds of money for new purposes. Is that specifically, um, you, you said it's, it's because like, you know, base money is always um, scarce. 
sort of by design? Is, is, is this a matter of the market trying to just increase the quantity of money or is it like different kinds of money for different uses? Or could, could you give any examples of that? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, my sense is that it, at, at the very least, it's he's talking about different kinds of instruments that might be denominated in the same currency, or 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 maybe might not be, but he views kind of, I don't know, this 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 he, he's kind of talking about the hierarchy, right? Um, and then an expansion of credit is is kind of uh, an expansion of the quantity and different types of instruments further down. Uh, in the hierarchy. Um, I don't know. Um, I, I guess I yeah. would disagree with that. I don't think he's necessarily talking about um, hierarchy. I think hierarchy helps solve stability because um, I think that that was the key difference between like the bimetallism versus having a system that was a gold standard and banknote dependent is that you could then have a system of leadership that was dependent on the Bank of England. So I think like hierarchy is a solution um, without necessarily being like a, it's a solution to stabilization. But I, I think, think on the reasons to like, why does new forms of money always emerge? I think it's just due to pure like innovation and sometimes circumstances create innovation as in the case of war. Um, but what was most intriguing to me is that he, you know, it's like a change in price is what creates a change in demand. And him saying like, that is the reverse of how you people usually think about it. They think about like quantity of money leading to change in prices when he's actually no, a change in price, which may mean because of some underlying change in demand, which may be for some reasons, is what motivates people to innovate and to change the supply of money so yeah, i thought for I think, me that was like oh i think i get that yeah I, I, this, is, this is what prices are for right it's like they're, they're, they're communicating information about how um, desired and how much in demand different things are and that's what affects the flow of money and the flow of goods and services and everything and it's how information is is, is communicated through the economy and it's how it adapts right to, to, to what people want ultimately i think i get that um, I think maybe what Alex was getting up with the hierarchy thing is that like, um, you know, if, if it's base money, which is um, scarce and restricted, then adding these new layers underneath the hierarchy, like, you know, starting with gold and then and then currency and then bank deposits and then securities, um, the quantity goes up with each of these additional layers of the hierarchy. Every every new um, sub layer of hierarchy that you add there effectively increases the money supply, right? Because, you know, we, we use bank deposits um as base money and, and we use currency as a substitute for gold and so on and so um like that's that's it's an innovation yeah but it's an innovation it's it's it's, it's an innovation that allows us to essentially create more money because we need it i think but i'm wondering like you know is it is it what what's fundamentally um driving these innovations and what problem is it solving is it the problem that there's, that there's not enough money out there or do we actually need different kinds of money for different situations which seem to be what um uh, Charlie was getting at in one of the quotes in that chapter, I think. Well, I think there are examples where we do need different kinds of money for different situations. Um, an example is kind of the different kinds of metal that were used as money, like um, gold would be, the coins would be too small to buy a beer. Um, so you need, you know, a different instrument, that kind of thing. Uh, so there, and, and then, you know, silver would be too heavy to, you know, buy something really big, you know, that kind of thing. So those are examples of like different kinds of money for different situations, almost. That, that feels like a, like an implementation thing, right? You've got the interface of money and the implementation of money and, and metal is one of the implementations and some implementations are more convenient than others, right? And uh, generally you want to like minimize the, the, the bulk and the mass of stuff that you're moving around when you pay for stuff. So that's that's a kind of innovation you would do, right? To get more convenient yeah. kinds of paying for stuff with. Maybe different implementations are more convenient in different contexts, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and especially when you're doing bigger scale trades, right? There's a, there's a greater necessity for an efficient implementation of money there because you're making bigger payments and it's more important to, you know, like 1% of a, of a big payment is a bigger deal if it's a larger transaction that's going on, maybe. Yeah. The question is, is that what um, Kindleberger was talking about there? Yeah. 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 I think, I think one thing that is 
really, really quite striking is that the innovation typically happens happens with credit money, right? It's sort of credit uh, rather than inventing additional. Sorry, you broke up a little bit. You right? said the so innovation that's, happens that's, that's with the key, and I think private money is that what you're saying, Jay? Credit, credit, credit money, credit money, credit money. So it's um, the key thing here is. I think Kindle Berber, and I think the different circumstances basically means that the money is perhaps, yeah, of course, we're talking about the, the I'm just quoting Perry here in the historical instances, crypto might be another example for us to figure out, but it's not solving a different problem potentially. It's not, it's not coming from market practice either. So it's sort of a different, uh, different dimension. We can get into crypto in a second. But the key thing is that the credit element allows it to be independent of lo the location of the reserve. And I think when we think, just simply think of a flat sort of quantity, that is not a helpful concept because the reserve that we're trying to clear in is not necessarily in the location or it, both in terms of the, 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 the balance sheet and then the time when we need it, right? And credit can get around this location so and time aspect quite well. So I think so that's an the, important sort of innovation. Yeah. Yeah. The, the instead of um, okay, the, the innovation is that instead of having to basically stuff the money in onto your mattress or something, the money itself, the reserve can be off somewhere, you know, in a bank somewhere safe, and uh, because you're using credit, and it's like the bank owes you the money, and that's what you're using as money now, um, the reserve can be somewhere else, and you don't have to bother with it yourself, and that that's more convenient. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. And the, the, the point is not just location right now, it's in the bank vault somewhere, but it's also in the future somewhere, right? I'm getting paid tomorrow. Therefore, I can, I can use that as a, as, as a way to, get, to pay you today um, with, with credit as well, with a promise to pay rather than... And a lot of the innovation we've seen in the last 30 years, essentially taking you know, bonds, lock, things that are locked up somewhere, you know, payments that are locked up somewhere, but turn them into sort of money today, right? Um, through through credit, with through repo operations or other operations, which essentially, um, yeah. So that's I think where an innovation comes from to lock up and not make uh, money base money locked up somewhere in a in a vault or in the future somewhere, but make it accessible today. And that requires this sort of financial innovation to sort of make that happen and, and a market to make that go around. If that breaks, then obviously we're back to the money is locked up somewhere and uh, we can't get it. But I think the, the point is that this, this sort of credit money unlocks economic activity that otherwise would not happen. And it's, uh, it's something that's especially important for financially less or financially less developed countries because their money actually is scarce and it's very difficult to get investment. It's very difficult to make payments. So you kind of have to innovate on that front uh, to uh, spur the economic um, acti activity. And that's, what, that's, I think, a point of chapter, chapter nine. So we're talking about the, the, the shiftability of long-term debt, there, right? Which is one of the sort of... Um recent trends that I think Perry Mullen was talking about towards the end of the move is the, is the way the economy evolves with, with shadow banking. We, 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 we have markets for long-term debt and that makes long-term debt more convertible into um, money, liquidity that you can spend right now, right? And thus makes it effectively a kind of money in itself because it's all about convertibility. As long as something's convertible into money easily, then it is money for all intents and purposes. Cool. Larissa is bringing up some some good points in the chat. Oh. Yeah, because I think that well, that question of like what what is the nature of innovation, and then what kind of innovation then drives the creation of money is a really good one, and I think it's probably one where Char where Charlie's views evolved over time, because it was interesting the contrast. Like he he uh, didn't seem to believe that there would be solutions that would emerge from like if the world were to convert to um, flexible exchange rates. He thought like, oh, there would be no stabilization mechanisms, short-term credit would take over and there would be a collapse of long-term credit. But I guess there fundamentally is the need for long-term credit that is like a fundamental demand of money in that specific form. Um, so solutions just emerged around it. 
so you were saying that like we we can't just sort of sit back and real life on the market to just sort of like sort things out automatically in some sort of decentralized way by itself you need some kind of leadership and, 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 and some kind of some kind of yeah some kind of hierarchy no so i would actually just i would say that the markets will sort things themselves out and they do the thing yeah. that however because um due to just volatility of demand and the facts that you know things change there can be a significant short-term disruptions and that's what calls for leadership so i thought like one of i don't know when he had his like dialectical synthesis of money supply fixed over long term while elastic during short run crisis i thought that was like very revealing it's like you need yeah. to be able to be elastic to manage crises yeah went freely with the high rate yeah I mean, I think it's it's deeper than the. He obviously makes a much bigger point than the the simple British banking system because it, the fact there's a couple points that I think in the. Uh, let me see where where this is in my notes. This is chapter chapter eight. Yeah. When we, when he discusses the um, sorry when he discusses world and depression. Obviously, in the first, the first, um, in the first edition, he says, for the world to be stabilized, there has to be a stabilizer. And in the sort of the, the old Bank of England model, that was sort of okay because um, Britain was at the top and it was sort of all implicit. So the, the country model sort of fit on the world quite well. But I think in the modern world, there's, it's a bit more complicated. So here's the three points he initially states. Maintain a relatively open market for distressed goods. And that is long-term lending, essentially. Sorry, that's the second, second point. Provide a counter-cyclical longer-term longer, longer -term lending. So basically stable long-term lending. So don't have, don't have that breakdown. Uh, have a, don't have fire sales sort of uh, disrupt the short-term lending, which is the first point A and C is discounting in a crisis. So this is sort of, for me, more, more so than the money supply, uh, the key driver is the long-term lending, which is sort of, implies a money supply in, in, in a sense, but it's sort of, uh, that, that is sort of a, a relational thing rather than, and this is an international thing rather than domestic thing, right? So the, the problem with money supply is also how does it get into the international sphere where it's needed rather than being locked up in, domestically. And I think for him is making sure that this sort of long-term lending is stable internationally and that we support the short-term volatility by having an open market on distressed goods. But then he, um, I think the later edition, he says this requires more explicit thinking that we don't have, didn't think through earlier, which was he adds um, policing the stable exchange rates. So stable exchange rates are an important factor here, which and then and then coordination of macroeconomic policies. And we can get we can get into that discussion because these two points um did not have to be solved in the gold standard because we had fixed exchange rates um and sort of the macro the macro coordination also happened implicitly in the gold standard which then didn't happen in flexible exchange rates so it's not a solution it creates another type of problem that has to be solved somewhere right so one solution is to at least not have all huge volatility of exchange rates he mentioned somewhere also in chapter 10 that exchange rates actually are diverging too much. It's not, this is not an ideal situation. There's too much volatility in the exchange rates, which then also has implications on the long-term lending and all the, the short-term lending hot money. It's sort of all this stuff that we're trying to overcome is not really dealt with in the proper way. And uh, the macroeconomic coordination is something that has to happen. You can't just punt on that. Um, so I think that's interesting that he adds these two dimensions in the later edition of uh, financial, um, no, world and depression. That is, yeah. So um, I wanted to kind of mention that it 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 could simultaneously be true that stability requires a stabilizer and that markets will naturally stabilize. You just have to, um, you have to have a force that. It has to be true that markets naturally tend toward the emergence of stabilizers or that stabilizers naturally emerge, right? 
Um, so you can have this, and I think Kindleberger often thinks in these two levels, like there's what is market, what are the markets going to do? And then there are this, this evolutionary process of institutions um, emerging to, to, to fill uh, the needs of the market. So the stabilizer might come from kind of this evolutionary process that is in some set, sense above the market, but is also responding to feedback from the market, right? Like if the market is without the necessary institutions, if the market is collapsing or failing or something like that, then that provides feedback to the people who are, you know, kind of managing these institutions or creating these institutions to create better institutions that that help guide the market better, that kind of thing. Um, so I think both of these things can kind of can kind of be true at this at the same uh, time. And I don't know that Kindleberger. I'm actually I, I don't actually don't know this. I don't know that Kindleberger. Um, or I don't know if he was imagining the way he probably wasn't imagining the way in which things kind of stabilized um, after the uh, advent of of uh, floating exchange rates. Um, and what kind of happened was you you had um, you know all of these uh, FX derivatives, FX swaps, and and you know uh, forward rate agreements, and you know uh, interest rate parity, and and stuff like that. Um, that kind of uh, the inst these were the institutions that kind of emerged to to stabilize the international monetary system. So you still kind of had a single international currency, but you had um, the this uh, weird interface between that international currency and the various uh, domestic currencies. Um, and there's still this kind of instability uh, in international credit that exists uh, in today's world that I wonder if Kindleberger, if you were around, he would say you won't you wouldn't have that in a fixed exchange rate world or something like that. Um, but it would also so you have, you know, um, kind of, uh, you know, carry trade building up, um, you know, currency imbalances between different countries and stuff like that. And then it gets the pressure gets to be too much and it snaps back that kind of thing. Um, you know, I wonder if this is a consequence of or or, or partly facilitated by the fact that we have uh, floating exchange rates that that allow you know this kind of um, uh, trading to emerge and this kind of this kind of market condition to exist. Um, so I don't know that Kindleberger was hundred percent wrong that um, everything uh, would be bad under under floating exchange rates because certain things maybe are are bad even today. Um, but what the floating exchange rate does get you is it gets you some flexibility for individual countries to kind of maybe. Um, do some uh, uh, some of their own stuff without being constrained by having to be on the same currency as everyone else. But if they do too much of that, then then it ends up falling apart. So the constraint is still there. It's just maybe further out uh, and it's associated with more instability rather than if you just lock yourself into, okay, everyone has the same currency or something like that. Does that make sense? Does some of what I said just now make sense? The, the no, problem, I mean, you're 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 right with. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, go ahead, Jay. The the only the only point that I would like to raise here is that um, when you venture too far out there, or you try to venture outside the system, you are creating this relative problem, right? The Gresham's law, which I think is pretty strong strong argument that we sort of when you want to do that, and you're not you don't have you don't have the ability to sustain that system domestically. You will always incentivize instability domestically. Um, by making your own population choose the market choose between your own credit system and and foreign credit or the international credit. So I think there is not. I think he's making a pretty clear clear point. Perry through Kindleberger is making a pretty clear point that there is no independence in that sense. Right? You cannot sort of think outside in the international system like we're we're baked in. That and so I think leadership actually. Let's go back to that point. The, the leadership point is actually to support central bank cooperation. The leader has to support uh, long-term lending in the periphery, market for distressed goods. This is a, this is, goes both ways, right? And depending on where the pressures come from, comes from, there is a public good to be managed, which is you want to keep things within sort of in Perry's parlance, the outside spread. You want to set an international outside spread for all kinds of stuff, right? Uh, that has to be managed to do together uh, by all the, the major actors. And uh, the the key thing is that market by itself doesn't set these spreads necessarily. The the fact that flexible exchange rates are too volatile; they're not converging stable. They're they're completely volatile and diverging. He made that point somewhere in chapter nine or ten 
Um, we have uh, instable long-term lending markets. We have we don't have a, a, a buyer of last resort for for stress, distressed goods, internationally speaking. So all these outside spreads don't exist in our public goods that we need for this international system to be upheld. And there's a benefit for everybody, the leader and the follower, to maintain that system of outside spreads. Um, and that's, I think, what uh, Perry is essentially trying to say through Kindleberger, that we need to understand that this is the international system. The best way to manage this is collectively, not as individual countries, but in a sort of collective sort of understanding of uh, leader and followership. And that comes at a cost because politically speaking, it's almost not viable in a lot of instances if it's um, if it's not um, managed in a in a way that uh, you know you can sell it to your populace uh, as as something proper. And the benefit of venturing outside that's it's not very big because you you're going to end up like Argentina. Yes, you can print your own money, but your own population will not accept your own money because there's an international money that you would rather have. Um. So could you just um, elaborate on uh, buyer of last resort for distressed goods? What does this mean? I've not heard of buyer of last resort before. Or dealer of last resort, maybe. Or dealer. Um, buyer of last resort is another way of saying dealer of last resort. Really, you don't necessarily need a seller of last resort. That's not usually the side of the end of things you're trying to backstop. It's not like everyone's trying to buy and there's a huge panic and a crisis and you need someone to like step in and sell. I mean, there are, um, you know, if you, if the price gets too high and, and, you know, like that kind of thing, um, but it's not the same kind of crisis that you have on the, on the downward side. So a distressed good would be something like mortgage backed residential securities, um, something that's on your balance sheet, but you're struggling to sell it to find a market for it. And that, that that's what it means for it to be distressed. You need someone to buy it for you. And if the dealers aren't there, then you need to deal with class resort to buy it for you. And that yeah. can happen with like um, real goods as well. Or is it mostly just like um, financial instruments that we talk about that? I think this is a question we should ask Perry because I had that question too, because he talks about commodities a lot, which are also, of course, real goods. But the, the, um, the thing that he mentions in the depression the key driver of the depression was that we kind of over uh, underemphasize the stock market crash how commodity prices um, put pressure on balance sheets and inventory. Um, so those mechanisms are really key. I think I would really, um, really like to know what Perry thinks about this. And he, I think the main point is that somewhere, maybe I'm just making this up right now, but I, maybe I, I think I read that every everything is essentially financial good or a finan financial asset. Um, and, and that must include commodities or real goods in the sense too. This is all treated as a as a part of the payment system, pay, the payments process. And if you cannot, if you cannot, if you're sitting on inventory that's not money, uh, because essentially all our balance sheet is sort of we calculate it as money, but we don't have have access to it. I think that's the same problem that I just mentioned earlier. Like it's locked up somewhere, it doesn't do you any good, um, and you're still trying to monetize it, just like on the way up. Everything is monetized. Everything is you can sell essentially everything on the way up in a, in a, in a when the bubble um, expands, and essentially none of that is possible on the way down. And that's really the key of what we call a liquidity crisis. And I think it's a breakdown that's sort of convertibility. Of the, exactly, a breakdown of of market makers that will help with convert, converting whatever you have on your balance sheet into cash. Cool. So we should ask Perry what he talks about exactly. I think he would say anything is a financial asset, essentially anything that people want to or need to sell in a crisis. I think uh, Minsky used to say, right, that everyone is a bank and all assets are financial assets, kind of conceptually. I like this way of thinking. I like uh, the idea of like not having really hard dichotomies between um, well, basically anything. Yeah. Yeah, everything's a continuum. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, quite. Yeah, and the Perry is, of course, always objecting politely to this notion of real economy, monetary economy, because he says there's nothing more real than the need to make a payment. Like the money that has to go out of your balance sheet today, there's nothing more real and nothing drives behavior, behavior more than that need. Yeah, so I, 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 like to, I mean, I like to define the word real as like that which is of consequence, right? That which actually really forces your behavior at the end of the day when push comes to shove, right? And that's the survival constraint. That's the need to make payments, right? 
Yeah, I think it depends on how we define the word real, because there is sure. something, uh, there is a useful distinction to be drawn between the uh, money part of the economy and the physical, you know, goods and services that are produced and consumed and, you know, used in manufacturing and that kind of stuff. So, so economists use the term real in a few different ways. That's one of the ways they use the term real is to kind of describe the the actual stuff and and the money is is kind of a derivative of actual stuff that's facilitating uh the production and consumption and investment and that kind of stuff so i think i i i don't know that i fully am on board with with perry's objection because i think it's kind of a semantic thing he's just trying to he's trying to draw attention to the importance of money it's real in that it matters um but it's not real in the sense of being the real economy in terms of how we talk about the real economy so i i kind of would push back on that a little bit yeah and this is the whole this thing this is what the whole money thief thing is about right supposedly uh contemporary economists they mostly don't think of money as a real thing and they overemphasize the distinction between the monetary side and the real side and perry's just trying to say uh you know actually money is a real thing and we can study it um but still yeah. obviously we can't just dissolve that distinction entirely because there'd be no point in having any money at all if there was something actually real. I wish I wish that Perry were using a word other than real, uh, because real is already used to mean not only this, but also like real versus nominal and, you know, all kinds of things in economics. Um, I think if he had said money is important or something, yeah, I don't know, some, some other terminology, but I think he's partly using the word real kind of for rhetorical purposes um, to really get you to go, oh, wait a minute, huh? But I don't, I, I, you know, like, of course, the distinction between the monetary side of the economy and the real economy is, is important, even if it is a continuum uh, to some extent as well. I think there's also something that I don't even know. I don't know how to put this exactly into precise words. But when we talk about real versus financial economy, there's something that we're meaning about things that are like tangible versus non-tangible, which I think is what Alex is saying. However, that also seems connected to even like the point of distinction between Kindleberger and Minsky, where Kindleberger is it's more of like the the financial, like he's really concerned around like the, you know, um, the positive feedback loop that leads to crisis is based on like capital gains and losses. So it's on the financial side, while Minsky seems to be describing more of the phenomenon from like the real side. There's the sense in which people, it's kind of like the, the way in which I'm sympathetic to the monetarists is that there's a sense of worry when credit is created in a way that is without discipline. So it's that this at this weird place that people want to make sure that like financial goods are not untethered. Right. And Minsky's explanation is a bit of like, oh, how the untethering can happen on like the cash side. While Kendallberger's like, oh, this non this like more financial side is at the part of the feedback loop and that's what needs to be stabilized but that's kind of like why people get mad at why there's like this some people for some people the intuition is like there shouldn't be this stabilization because it's not real i don't know if that made any sense no i think what you're saying is that the monetary and financial side of the economy is what's driving um, or or what's going on in there is what's driving a lot of the crises and problems that happen there and also on the the quote unquote real side of the economy. And if we try to try to look for solution answers and of, of what's going on and solutions to the problem without paying attention to this monetary side, um, uh, then we're not going to necessarily, be able to to address those problems because the the monetary side is maybe the the center of the problem that we're looking at rather rather than the real side so it's that sense maybe in which uh the monetary side is is kind of more real and that it's more central to the to the crisis is that kind of what you're getting at and the instability yeah, and, yeah. But, but also trying to combine it with like what is the political resistance to some of the ideas that Kendallberg this idea of like hierarchy like what you know there's just like something there to it. What was, what, was, what did Jay say? So I, I want to just point out something, which is, I don't think that Kindleberger 
I think that it's easily it's easy to attribute Kindleberger, and he's trying to stay away from the fray from hey, I'm in the expansionist versus the contractionist camp. He's actually trying to find a way to marry these two things because both of these two, both both of them actually don't even ignore the essential point that inherent instability is a key feature, which is a previous point that now we've we've lost and have not recovered. So the fact that there's no way under no system um, that we can ignore the fact that inherent instability of credit will, will exist. And the fact that you say, I'm not gonna have a man management or backstop or any part of the system in order to discourage credit, will still create the credit somewhere in the system and you're gonna have a crisis and then it's unmanaged. So I think that's, and it kind of, you, you wanna actually uh, per Kindleberger Perry, create the conditions in which you're able to sort of set a parameter for this credit, this instability of credit to be properly managed, right? And that's not to sort of say encourage or not encourage it. Uh, I think that's a very, very fine line how to do that. Um, but I think um, we have to be very clear that this innovation will happen anyway, this sort of, and you can stop, try to stop it, but it will pop up, right? Um, and so if you acknowledge that point first, then actually the whole point like the whole point, like with, like the monetarists had their had their heyday, right? We had the 1844, the bullying, uh, the bullying report. We had the 1844 separation, uh, the Banking Act of, uh, in England, separation of the money supply versus from from the speculative stuff, and that didn't work. It just didn't. The system didn't really jive with this sort of uh, with the system, and then you have to manage it anyway afterwards. Um, so. A proper acknowledgement of the facts on the ground is the first thing. Let me just say a word to the previous discussion about real versus nominal, because, because I think it's a matter of representation, right? So the thing is that what we're missing here is a proper integration of stocks and flows, right? And I think when, when what Perry maybe emphasizes is an, and what uh, people like Kindleberger are talking about is long-term flows or flows in general should be emphasized and or in general, we don't have a good representation of this because we don't talk about inventory. We talk don't talk about balance sheets. And when you have a balance sheet, what what does it actually represent? It's claims, right? It is sort of, it is much more in a financial language in the in the real world sense. If you talk to anybody real, it's a, it is represented in the monetary sense. So that's why what turning it around, Perry is actually saying, yes, these are all claims, these are all representations, but essentially they're in this monetary logic that we're actually all thinking of money. Being. It's a balance sheet. It's nothing else, and everybody understands that, and everybody thinks in that way. They think of uh, of something that is equivalent, going just like like you were saying, Phil earlier. You were saying, okay, this this goes between money and 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 a real good. This thing is not separated in your mind. You have something that you think is money, but it's held in a, in an asset form, and you think that these things are essentially together. You cannot separate these two. So what I think Perry is saying is, we should not have a false dichotomy here between real and and monetary or financial, because these things can you cannot separate the way we have been separating them. Because in the end, um, whatever people are using in the real world that is a is essentially baked into the financial system, and the financial system is essentially baked into the real. And you cannot separate these things out and not think about money at all, or you cannot sort of not think at all about the underlying assets either. I think that's not what's happening in the financial sector either. People are always thinking about the underlying aspects as well, as much as it is volatile and sort of uh, the, the it's, it's as much about the relationship between different financial actors as it is about the relationship to the underlying assets. So these are things you cannot separate out. It's not so easy to say one is the other and one is more important than the other. And sometimes one dominates, sometimes another dominates. And in a crisis, I for example, just to, just to make that point clear, in the upswing, we see that the relationship to other financial actors is more important because the evaluation is determined by what other people are willing to pay for stuff. So the, that's where that relationship is emphasized. On the way down, the underlying assets or the underlying thing is important, but that's actually not enough because the underlying value is not there. Uh, and that's actually what you want to establish through Kinderburger because the, the market for the long distressed goods is essentially still make, maintaining that there's still a baseline price that's going to be paid because the instability of credit can actually destroy the entire market altogether. So this relationship, this underlying relationship to the real good is might not even be there in a crisis, right? So that's the, something you want to protect at all costs, right? So that's where this backstop function comes in. Sorry for- So 
going on just, in this. I just want to quickly mention that, um, you know, Perry does like to emphasize that money and credit are hierarchical and we lose really important understanding of how the system works when we pretend it's flat. But if you eliminate the distinction between real and monetary, you're also flattening a hierarchy there. And I think you're losing something uh, really important um, because there is, you know, money is kind of a claim on something above money, right? Um, and this is why we have four prices of money, right? Even though the hierarchy, as he draws it, has four levels and there's only like, you know, there's, there's, there's a price connecting each pair of levels, right? There's only three pairs of levels in four. It's because we've got real goods and services above it. The fourth price of money is the price of real goods and services, right? Yeah, I, I, I think that's the that's one way of one way of framing it. And I have framed it that way before. Um, but it's also true that, you know, money is there to facilitate the flow of actual stuff that you can eat and, 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 you know, <laughs> actually people can actually use like that's the whole, the whole economy is, is around, you know, allocating and organizing resources for production and for, for benefit, for consumption, that kind of thing. And money is below that hierarchy. It might be a continuum and that's fine. You can't draw a clear line. But, that, but, but, not, but none of that ever happens independently of money, right? No, think... none of it. No, the top of the hierarchy is not independent of the bottom of the hierarchy. That's true no matter which hierarchy we're talking but, about. Okay. First of all, I, I'm not sure if we should, because right, it's such a muddled a thing. <laughs> that, that point is so, so muddled, but I think it's, the, the thing is about representation, because I think we have such a hard grain sort of thing that money is one thing and goods are another. Uh, we already know that this is an inherently relational thing. Like uh, as soon as something's sitting in front of you, it's still, you can easily still frame it. Let's take away from money. It's just a, it's in a legal sense. Everything is, is anything ever not uh, a legal claim that you have in front of you? It's either yours or it's not yours, or it's a public good or it's a private good. Does it ever leave that sphere? No, it doesn't, right? So th th therefore, I also think money never, as long as that attached, the legal frame attaches, money attaches because we're evaluating, as long as there's goods, there's something there that that, that attaches to that. And I I appreciate the discussion. But I think it's a part of a matter of representation, right? How do we represent these things? And that's what the discussion is about. Um, so, yeah, so, so I don't think we have, this is a super semantic point that we have to make here, but I think it's sort of, uh, the, the real problem comes, uh, I think we're sensitive about the issues that are here. The real problem comes from the fact that if you just completely ignore it, like, like actually the ISLM framework that actually Kindleberg is up against, how does money actually represent it in this way? So it's just a number. It's not a balance sheet. It's not a claim. You don't have assets, liabilities. You have no way of properly representing that. And the problem is that money also does not enter uh, as an endogenous thing. That's sort of from you know relationships uh, that people uh, agree with each other, but it sort of emerges emerges exogenously from some other entity that just introduces money that's then being used, right? So that is sort of very a very limited concept of money, the way we understand it. And that's that's the consequence. If you sort of separate it out, it's very easy to sort of get to that sort of representation of money that's actually not helpful. Um, that's I think the contestation. We can bring this question up to Perry again. That's one of the questions we can sort of bring up again to sort of see how does this uh, how does he explain this? Because for me, I think we are in a big tension here because I think yeah, finding another word for this or another representation that goes beyond real and um, and nominal um, would would be helpful to sort of say, Perry would probably say something. It's an essential feature, so you cannot uh, you cannot even abstract from that. You cannot go away from that. It's sort of uh, whatever whatever we attach to a real good is essentially a financial thing in the first place, right? Uh, we cannot sort of separate that out. I what mean, would I, that I look think, like? That, yeah, I, I feel like the hierarchy of money just sort of solves this this question, doesn't it? You know, it's like they're all real. Some of them are more real than others, right? Whatever's higher up in the hierarchy is more real than what's below it. But they're all real, and how real it looks depends on whereabouts in the hierarchy you're sitting right now, I guess, right? I would say it's more accepted, right? So that's the thing we should not we should not sort of claim. I think it's very hard to say that a bank deposit is more real than some other uh, some other thing. The fact. The thing that he also brings out in, in, in one of the chapters is that 
the key feature is the acceptability of whatever you're putting out there, right? And that changes in different instances, but even the, in the crisis, all these certain things are accepted. That's that's what makes it the acceptability. Yeah, that's what makes something money, right? Something's money because people accept it as payment. So the more people who accept something as payment, the more like real money it is, right? And, and then the highest forms of money uh, that kind of get driven out by questions or well, other things that are accepted as payment in more places, right? Well, you, the bad money drives out good because you, you prefer to hoard the good money because it's more accepted. That's what makes it higher value, even if it has the same nominal value as the lower money, right? No, you yeah. hoard the good money because its price is actually different in some other context. It's it, it's undervalued in the context in which its price is the same as the other money. So you take it out of that context and melt it down and sell the silver or or go sell it somewhere where you can get a better price for it. <clears throat> or hoard right. it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and the acceptability problem, the, the issue with acceptability, uh, uh, you cannot, I, I don't think it's helpful to attach real to the acceptability uh, thing. The fact that um, m makes it more real. Yeah, I think it, it's, it's, it's difficult to sort of, uh, to sort of talk, talk about, about this because I think the essential lesson we know from money is that it's, it's, it's a relational thing, right? It's something we can uh, probably accept from the fact that whenever there's money, we somehow have to establish a relational uh, fact. And I think the ultimate relational thing is sort of to say, okay, um, when we do away completely with money, there's no, and then we just have you and yourself, um, then we can sort of go away from, 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 from money, if you will, or from exchange. Um, but I, I just have have a real trouble conceptualizing after, after having accepted, of course, Perry stuff. What real, how real would look without money, right? Or without claims, uh, without a, 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 a using the word claim uh, or property or something. Because uh, if we're completely removed from any legal or state or or relational uh, aspect, because that's that's ultimately what we what we have. Whenever we're in a relational uh, setting. Uh, money is in the picture and therefore it's essential to whatever conversation. There's at least three different senses of the word real that we have there. There's real in the sense of adjusted for inflation, real versus nominal. And then there's real in the sense of real goods and services versus money and finance. There's that sense of real. And then there's real in terms of, you know, what's important, what's the center of the mechanism that we're looking at, what's what's driving things, what should we pay attention to? So I think there's there's kind of just three different things. Yeah, and I, I one thing that brings us back to an earlier question. We should probably wrap up in a couple of minutes here. It's just to be, but I think um, if commodity prices, international commodity prices, are an essential part of the story to Kindleberger's explanation of the 1930s, um, then the question is: Is it because commodities are more real, uh, or are they because they're more financial? That, that's another question for like. What is the transmission mechanism? Because obviously the other real crowd, the monetarist, the Keynes and everybody else attributes no importance to commodities. And even though we've now established that it's maybe the most real thing, but if to Kindleberger, it's it's a financial phenomenon potentially, right? So that's that's why this is a driver of a crisis. So I think this is maybe a good question to bring up with Perry to sort of say, why are commodities a key to this international tr transmission mechanism, right? And I think it brings it back to the story quite nicely because ultimately this has no importance in the other stories uh, that are being told about the Great Depression when he's trying to recover that story about commodities. So there is something about um, this this asset class, uh, this real asset class or financial asset class that is driving a lot of the crisis. Good. So. Um, Let's just do the thing we did last time. Is there anything that stands out in this conversation that we didn't bring out properly in the conversation yet before we wrap uh, this session? I think I'm good. Uh, I'll just say that um, I'm looking forward to uh, reading the last two parts of Financial History of Western Europe after having uh, looked at chapter nine more closely. Phil, anything from you? I think I'm. I think I'm good. I might have another couple of things uh, noted down from the, the the reading that I did today. I could maybe bring those up, but uh, but but not much.
Uh, when are we when are we beating Perry? Is it at half past? Was it? In uh, in fifty minutes at noon, Eastern. Forty three okay. minutes from now, or fifty three minutes. Yeah. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yeah. I think the thing that I would like to bring out maybe once more is sort of the British financial revolution. It was not quite clear to me how that worked, why, why in which way that Perry describes the this financial revolution helped uh, England win wars, and what the subsequent evolution of the bank, the banking system in England, how that exactly worked out. I think that's a, a question mark I have for Perry. Um, and, no, there, is, uh, there is one thing I heard as well. Um, some party said, while the optimum scale of economic activity is getting larger and larger, the optimum scale of social, the optimal social scale appears to be shrinking. Um, yeah, it'd be interesting to see what that means. I have not exactly the same passage down as a question to Perry, because that's okay. a very big statement. Um, and I think also market uh, sort of government proposes, market disposes. I think I would like some more clarity exactly what that means, because it's sometimes seems like it's the opposite, right? Uh, that I'm not sure exactly how that logic works for Perry because it seems like it's the market that's driving a lot of the the story in Kimmelberger and um, governments are more or less blessing or not blessing the market process rather than uh, at least in the successful case. So I'd like to ask Perry why he's been using that reference repeatedly. And also what I don't understand necessarily is why after initial displacements, there's always a speculative boom, at least in the stories we've had. So the displacements, um, I can imagine why that is, but the displacement leading to a boom, that's part of every story I, we heard in the, in, the, in the chapter nine. As opposed um, to a displacement leading to a, a slowdown or something like that. Yeah, so displacement obviously means that we, in Perry, Perry's parlance, we're we're cutting off certain relationships and establishing new ones. And I guess I can walk it through like this would basically mean that we are opening up new channels, new channels of lending or um, exchange that then people become too enthusiastic about potentially. And that's a, that's part yeah. of the speculative boom. I like um, his uh, metaphor of uh water flowing over a flat surface and then it cuts grooves and then the displacement causes new grooves to form yeah yeah okay cool uh allison asker rock are you here to say any final words before we close all right so we'll just see you guys uh for the discussion with perry then uh, thanks very much for the great conversation once again, and uh, see you guys within the hour. Bye. All right, same